Good morning. It is 9.21 a.m. on Saturday, July 14th, 2018. I'm Christiana Ellis, and I just got up. This is five more minutes. And today is Saturday, and because I am uh, uh, a fan of the show, I've decided this summer I'm going to do a series rewatch of The Venture Brothers in preparation for the new season. This week I am talking about season three of The Venture Brothers, originally airing in 2008. Ten years ago. Crazy, right? Uh, so this season, uh, I, I, I talked last week about how season two is where the show kind of really becomes itself. And that's really evident here because season three is just chock full of episodes that are just really what I love about the show, uh, where we just take these characters... And uh, we know and love them from all of their previous history, but we continue to evolve them. I say we like it's me, but like the show continues to evolve these characters, move them through actual arcs, um, have actual changes in the status quo uh, at the same time that we just, you know, we continue to remix, we add new characters, um, lots of them who had just been, you know, simple jokes before. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we get Sergeant Hatred, who was a one-off joke uh, early on in, uh, I think, the, the episode where the boys were kidnapped by Myra, and now he's a full character. And if you've seen the series, you know he certainly sticks around even longer. But we have all sorts of other stuff going on. We have Brock's whole uh, arc here, where he... You know, he he goes through being forced to confront like actual feelings about, you know, his his operation here, how important he thinks it is, um, but also to, uh, you know, to uh, be really forced to reckon with his own past as well. And, uh, we you know, the whole arc of recognizing that his original mission you know in the orb episode we learn it's like oh is it actually was it actually not to protect rusty venture but rather to uh you know to protect this one particular device well maybe kind of except that that's also was what was told to him by hunter who is now working as a as a, as a female stripper um uh but uh, then we discover at the very end that there was a lot of stuff that was all set up. That Hunter lied to Brock about several things, including telling him that the OSI was trying to kill him, which allowed him, to, or which you know provoked Brock into uh, thinking he needed to kill these various assassins, which were actually the competition of Molotov's Blackhearts for whom Hunter is now a member, and there's just all sorts of that crazy stuff going on with Brock, and it culminates in this season with him quitting both jobs, both the OSI and working as Dr. Venture's bodyguard. So where will he go from here? Um, we also have an arc for Dr. Venture himself, right? In the second episode of this season, The Doctor is Sin, we have a return of Dr. Henry Killinger, um, Dr. Killinger, uh, who had uh, helped the monarch get back together with Dr. Girlfriend last season. Uh, but now we see him trying to help Rusty get his act together, but only to realize towards the end in an amazing sort of scene that he is setting Dr. Venture up not to be a hero, but to be a villain. And it's this catharsis moment for Rusty where he thinks about that and makes the call that no, he doesn't want to do that. Now, it doesn't immediately make him a great person, but we've seen him do a lot of stuff that is, you know on the darker end of morally gray, uh, but when confronted with the idea of just officially becoming 
a bad guy, he decides, no, that's not what he wants. And then over the course of this season, we see him sort of struggling with this sense of identity that, you know, is continuing with this uh, element of uh, his jealousy and resentment against uh, Jonas Jr., who seems to be better at everything, despite having only been outside of the uh, outside of his body for a year um and uh and all that sort of a resentment and uh we get uh ultimately in the orb episode again which is uh, this really big turning point for lots of elements of the show uh we see him going on an adventure with billy quizboy and feeling it again he says and then making a decision that um you know, with the orb, like there's, you know, Brock has been told, you know, if he tries to use it, you have to kill him. But in finding it and realizing his dad, he's like, he may have been a bad dad, but he was a great scientist and he hid it away for a reason. And making the call to be smart about it and not just use it or try to sell it or whatever, which is probably what he would have done uh, previously, and so it's an arc for Dr. Venture. Um, we also get lots of stuff, great stuff with the Monarch and uh, Dr. Girlfriend. Now, Dr. Mrs. the Monarch, which is an amazing thing. I just, Dr. Mrs. the Monarch, that when they revealed that and that became just her name now, it's like, I mean, on the one hand, we could certainly talk about the idea of having a female character be d defined only by her relationship to um, another male character. But I don't, I think that's, um, I think that in the context of this show, where not only is she very obviously the more competent uh, one uh, in the relationship, she's such an awesome character that I think it works totally as a joke. And um, it's, it's, uh, and I just love it. Plus, her new costume is great, even if it's super creepy when her murderous moppets um, talk about, like, <laughs> I like hugging you in your new costume. Um, anyway, <laughs> lots of good stuff in this season with the monarch and Dr. Mrs. the Monarch, uh, where they have essentially succeeded. They're official with the guild now as a duo and not a villain and number two. And uh, they move into the Phantom Limbs old house, which is an apparently in a gated community for supervillains, which is ridiculous. And they have a dinner party, which is ridiculous. And then it just further in this season, we really hash out and uh, further explore the idea of the Guild of Calamitous Attent intent versus the OSI as organizations with bureaucracy and red tape and this idea that um, like what it's all about like to hear Brock defending to Jonas Jr. the idea of the Guild of Calamitous Intent and having them actually have that argument is kind of amazing because it's the sort of like it's not fourth wall breaking but it is exactly the sorts of questions that we as the audience would have about like, how does this organization make any sense? And why is there this whole thing about escalation of threat level and everything of the, uh, this, this, um, sense that's like, what? So like, he's coming to try to menace me, but I'm not allowed to just kill him. Or else, like, you know, like, what? We're supposed to... It's like a game. And uh, Brock is basically saying, look, this is an organization. They, they like their system. This keeps crazy people to where they try to follow rules most of the time. So if you can work with them on that level, then they don't degenerate, degenerate into chaos and make it worse. And it's just amazing stuff. But where it becomes genius in this season is where it uses that whole setup to allow Monarch to now follow basically an, a, an obscure subclause of the Guild Handbook. He's been frustrated the whole season 
that even though he's official now, he's not allowed to to be the uh, arch nemesis of Dr. Venture, who he really wants to. But now that arching Jonas Jr. and Jonas Jr. tried to kill him, now he can extend his vengeance to extended vengeance, and he can now arch his true desired target all along. Um, it's just, it's this incredible moment in, in this, um, in this season. And, uh, I, I just, I love it so much. <laughs> and I also love that they have in a similar way that I was just describing the, this conversation with Brock and Jonas Jr. We have a brief conversation with Dr. Girl, uh, well, Dr. Mrs. The Monarch and, uh, her, her Moppets where they're kind of trying to get a straight answer out of her of like, why is it that the monarch hates Dr. Venture? Like, what is it that he did? Why does he want revenge? Why is he so devoted? And she just repeatedly doesn't answer their question, but in a way that makes it, you know, it's, it's obviously like she just, she's distracted. And so she keeps answering slightly different versions of the question. And um, so it's, it, it's, it's definitely like playing with the audience there because, you know, we wonder that too. And it's like, why, but why? But it also, what's great about it is having her kind of talk a little bit about like, what is it that she sees in him? Because, uh, it's true that she is much more competent than him. And so we could ask is like, well, why, you know, what is it about the monarch that, you know, like, why did, what does she see in him? And the answer is that she, he's got passion. Essentially he's got passion and drive and spirit and motivation, and he's not always good at everything, but she admires that about it. And, and I think that's fantastic. Um, and so there's lots of other good stuff too. Um, like we have a couple of episodes like, uh, Dr. Quim medicine woman that introduces, um, you know, another sort of set of characters, uh, Dr. Quim and, uh, Ginny, her, her bodyguard and their, her, um, and Dr. Quim's, uh, daughters, Nancy and Drew. And, uh, that they're, they only are in, I think that one episode, actually, I'm not sure if they even ever show up again so far in the series. I think maybe they do can't remember now um but uh in any event that's a fun little bottle episode um and uh so there there's lots of there's so much great stuff in this season but let's talk about where this season ends at the end you know so not only do we have brock quitting osi and uh um and being bodyguard um transitioning to, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. The clone army for Hank and Dean have both, uh, have all been destroyed. Um, and that's, that's following up on giving Dean and Hank a little bit more growth this season too. Um, becoming, you know, their own people more instead of just being, uh, you know, sort of the twins. And, uh, let's see, we also, we, we met Dermot. Uh, <laughs> um, who is, seems to be probably Brock's son. It's a little bit unclear what's going on there exactly, but, um, he's weird. And, uh, and they killed 24, 21 and 24 even had a whole episode where they're sneaking through and they're talking to henchman number one and talking about how, you know, it's like, they're essentially invulnerable. Nothing ever happens to them. And then there's this moment of fate where they're talking about how they're doing the safe thing by not getting into the battle. And then just by a sh crazy sequence of events, all hinging on the moment that for some reason, 24 put on his seatbelt, even though they're sitting in a stationary car and, um, and, and so 24 dies and 21 gets hit in the face with his buddy's flaming head. <laughs> And so all sorts of crazy stuff going on. And I just love the show so much. Season three is great stuff. And next week, we'll talk about season four. And uh, in the meantime, tomorrow is my regular rewatch series of The Melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya. And in general, I'll talk to you tomorrow for five more minutes. <laughs>